a Playlist Original. Hey everyone, Jeff here from Films at Home. Thank you for coming back to the Films at Home podcast today. Uh, in this episode, we've got a pretty good conversation with a friend of mine named Kevin. Now, Kevin actually is one of the owners of The View in JP, which is one of the last video stores in the country, and I believe the last one in the Boston area. JP stands for Jamaica Plain. It's one of the neighborhoods around Boston, sort of like, you know, Brooklyn or the Bronx around New York City. Jamaica Plain is very close to Boston. It's one of the major neighborhoods. And Kevin owns this video store in there, and they do video rentals and have a rental subscription program. But it's also a cafe where they sell baked goods and coffee and tea. So it's a really unique, cool place to check out. And so I was super excited to talk to Kevin for this episode today. We talked physical media. We talked some of the trends. We talked about you know what he sees happening in the future, how he's been able to stay afloat in a world full of streaming and streaming services. So a really fun conversation. Kevin's super knowledgeable about movies and about the industry. So we got into a lot of like really deep topics and it's a pretty long episode, but I think it is one that you guys will enjoy. So sit back and relax, enjoy this interview. And as always, make sure you're subscribed if you're watching on YouTube and if you're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're at. If you enjoy the episode, leave us a five-star review and make sure to follow along there as well so you always get the latest audio feed. Now, let's get right into our sponsor and then the interview. So today's episode is sponsored by Established Titles, who have finally helped me reach my lifelong goal of becoming a Scottish Lord and living my Braveheart fantasy. Now, it's November. We're all looking for fun gifts. You can see I've got mine right here. Lord Jeff Rossio. I am an official Scottish Lord. And Established Titles, it's a super fun novelty gift for friends and family. It also helps preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland and global reforestation efforts. So Established Titles is based on the historic Scottish custom where landowners are called lairds or lords and ladies. And as you can see, I am now a Scottish Lord. Uh, so please refer to me from now on as Lord in the comments from here on out. Thank you for your understanding. Title packs from established titles give you at least one square foot of dedicated land on a private estate in Edelston, Scotland, complete with your official certificate, framed, a unique crest, and a unique plot number. With the purchase, you can actually officially use the title Lord or Lady on your social media platform. You can use it on your dating profiles. You can even use it on a plane ticket or a credit card. You're officially a Lord or a Lady with this thing, and it's a great last-minute gift that's sure to get some laughs. Established Titles also plants a tree with every order, working with charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. So it's a fun gift that actually helps to preserve the environment. And you know what? That's very Lord or Lady like of you. So the first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link, you'll be placed within a few minutes walking distance to my plot, which is laid out here. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or a lady, you know, we could build our own little films at home kingdom. So plus established titles is actually running a massive Black Friday sale right now. So if you use the code films at home, you get an additional 10% off at checkout. So go to establishedtitles.com slash films at home, get your gifts now and help support the channel. All right, everyone. So here's the interview with Kevin, one of the owners of the VU in JP. Now, if you don't know what JP is, that's uh, Jamaica Plain, one of the one of the neighborhoods in Boston. Um, so the VU actually stands for the the Video Underground. I was just informed, so now I know. And that was the name of the the location uh, prior to the, I guess, the rebranding you guys did. So. Um, yeah, do you want to give us a little background on sort of you and what you're doing and what the VU is all about? Uh, sure. Uh, the the VU as in Video Underground. The Video Underground started in Jamaica Plain at a different location about 20 years ago. It's 20 years ago this month. Uh, it was locally owned, locally operated. Uh, it's had a few different ownership uh, switches over the years. But, uh, but yeah, it was kind of an alt video store uh, carried... The way that a lot of, I think, smaller indies started kind of tail in the 90s into the early 2000s when Blockbuster and some of the other chains had kind of 
really leveled out the the kind of the original crop of mom and pops. Uh, there was a whole bunch of alt style, independent, maybe more uh, uh, boundary pushing uh, video stores that cropped up around that time. Uh, the video underground being one of them. Uh, but yeah, ran uh, switched owners. I think in about 2011, I came on board uh, at the tail end of 2013. Uh, when it was looked like it was teetering pretty hard. My idea for it was to sort of do a version of what we do now, but in the old location. Uh, we got hustled out of that location very quickly uh, and ended up uh, about a mile away uh, in the same neighborhood. Uh, but now we do coffee. We have, you know, snacks and baked goods, kind of keep cafe hours. We're not one of those. Yeah, we're open till 11 places, but... <laughs> Those open to yep. 11 places are usually, um, you know, firing up a convection oven to make cookies at 630 in the morning. Um, so, yeah, but that's uh, this is kind of, you know, pandemic hiccups and everything else aside. This is kind of what I thought would work and what would make sense in this location. We still maintain a video library. I still think of us as very much a video store. Uh, you know, we obviously have customers who are want their want their latte and their muffin and could not care less <laughs> about the movie stuff. Whereas we have people who are regular uh, media subscribers, you know, who maybe get a snack every now and again, but they're really, uh, they're here for the movies. They're here for the screenings. They're here for the back catalog. They're here for the new releases, uh, that kind of thing. So it's definitely a video store. When you walk in, you see racks and spines and uh, displays, all that kind of stuff. But the, uh, but it's also very much a coffee shop too. Yeah, I love I love the idea of that because I think it is nice. I mean, just to differentiate too, so you can get different people in and expose them to the video store aesthetic without it necessarily having to be a video store. Like you said, you right. can just you could get a coffee if you want to, but also sure. while you're there, you know, there's all these racks of movies, which is super cool. Um, and then you guys have the micro cinema too, the the screening room, right? Yes, which is where I am right now. I don't want to crane my yeah. camera neck or run the risk <laughs> of doing anything weird but you can see a uh a screen uh down there we've got uh we've got some theater seating that kind of stadiums up we've got some high top tables uh we rent the room out regularly for private events which is probably the most uh kind of the most appealing thing we do uh we did public events for years on the other side of the pandemic the cost of licensing which we always paid uh plus the uh city of boston has what's called a non-live entertainment license uh and when i explain to people what that is how you're supposedly you're really supposed to cut the uh cut the city in if you've got like a pool table or like a pinball machine uh but since we were already part of the kind of city permitting ecosystem uh with our health permit and all the other stuff i don't know if uh, we were uh, marked from the get-go, but between the licensing cost and the non-live entertainment cost, doing public events the way we had done for years went from a thumbs-up break-even proposition to a, oh man, there's no way to do this and not <laughs> lose money. Uh, so now we basically yeah. just do subscriber screenings for people that are part of our uh, media subscription tiers. Uh, which is, you know, it's not what we envisioned, but you know, if I could go back to four years ago, there's a lot about the world that in our, <laughs> and, and doing, and doing, running a business yeah. in Boston that would, would not have, uh, would have seemed uh, far fetched at the time. So yeah, we do, uh, subscriber events on Fridays and Sundays, but most people, when they find out about the screening room, they want to have a party. They want to get their friends together. They want to, you know, you can play video games. They want to watch a football game. They want to watch a basketball game. We've got a whole bunch of dates booked for the world cup. But it's a place where people can kind of congregate and watch something. Sometimes it's a movie. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, a family of five playing Mario Kart and someone leaving in tears. <laughs> it. uh, it's it's We really run the <laughs> gamut in terms of uh, events and uh, and what we can accommodate. Yeah, no, that's super cool. I, I love the idea of that because I don't, I don't think enough places have that sort of gathering okay. space for... Mm -hmm. for movies I, I sort of you know people i guess i like i try to build one in my house with a with a home theater where i'm like i want to be able to like screen movies and like have friends or family over and watch stuff mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people obviously don't have access to that or the you know the means to do that so it's really it's really cool and that you do these events and you know show these movies but also give people the ability to rent it out um it's that it's that cultural type thing that is 
missing from so many places where the, there used to be so many of these little indie movie theaters um, mm-hmm. and video stores where you could gather yeah. with people who had similar, you know, mindset and talk movies. And it's just like, it's disappeared with streaming. It's like you have Twitter and it's like, uh, trust me, yeah. nobody <laughs> wants to get into film conversations on Twitter. It's a mess. I, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's I mean, not to, you know, but the, when you say social, so much of what we think of now as social is social media, not yeah. talking to a human in real time that you right. can like, you know, see. Um, and I think we try to create spaces for that, both in the screening room and uh, out on the, out on the floor. I mean, you can have a conversation with someone, someone can join in the conversation, but no, but it never, it's impossible for it to go the way so many Twitter conversations go or like letterbox comment debacles, all that kind of stuff. I mean, the uh, people being able to connect online about movies is awesome until someone makes the decision to make it awful and they can really <laughs> dig in on it and they've got all the time in the world. And, yep. you know, it's, it's you're when you're forced to talk to someone one on one and they say something you disagree with when you're standing in front of them, uh, you're not going to. Well, you're more likely to not just kind of level insults and, uh, <laughs> right. you know, check check the wikipedia page for the movie real quick to like see if you can catch them in something mm-hmm. uh you know you have to listen to someone they have to listen to you uh it's it's a way different dynamic and yeah the way people meet in the screening room even the subscriber screenings now that they're not public public people still meet each other you, people still see someone from the last thing they saw mm-hmm. that kind of thing and the the subscriber events are not always you know sell out big crowd kind of thing, but people end up getting to know each other and they see people at similar events and, uh, and that kind of thing. And there's a, there's a social component that too, even if it's not interactive in the strictest sense, building familiarity uh, with your, with your peers or a peer group or this kind of subset, subset peer group. uh, I think there's still value in that. No, definitely. Yeah. There's, there's a huge, and that is what's missing from, from the internet. Planet earth. Yeah, there's, yeah. well, yeah, planet Earth, period. <laughs> but th- it's great that we have all this access and I can talk to somebody in California or in mm-hmm. Japan about movies mm-hmm. and connect with each other in seconds. But you're right. It's like, yeah, you get, you, you wouldn't just walk in somewhere and just start screaming in somebody's face about how you didn't like Star Wars in the latest trilogy. Yeah. That somebody would do on, like, you would have a civilized conversation, hopefully. And you also can't be the, desk you know armchair expert who has x who just looks things up on the internet and it's like you actually have to form your own opinions and yeah that's it it is missing in even just like movie from critics and reviews and online fandom and this whole idea of like we're gonna make a petition to reshoot this movie and it's like we're so we're so removed from reality right now that it's good to have these nice grounded spaces to just go and talk to people and enjoy a movie and like have good conversation that isn't off of planet earth in in space because yeah right it's so crazy so i think i think what you're doing is important and we need we need more places like that in you know these key locations that can support it of course you know sure the boston community i think has been pretty good for for film for a long time um yeah i yeah i mean uh, in terms of in terms of uh uh, cities. I mean, on some level, the the Boston metro area is really an, an embarrassment of riches for for film goers. I mean, between the you know you have rep theaters, you have the museums, you have the universities, you have the smaller colleges, all that kind of stuff. I mean, you can. Uh, and again, this is always the, the the pandemic always casts a pall on on all this stuff. But you know, you have uh, so many opportunities to check out a variety of films in a metro area like Boston. Uh, I mean, my, I don't ever worry about Boston being no longer a film hub between the, uh, the larger festivals, the, the smaller niche genre festivals, all that kind of stuff. I mean, I think Boston's going to be fine. I do worry about, um, uh, smaller towns, quote unquote, flyover country where I am from. Um, you know, if you're, if your local cinema is an AMC and it's some number of miles away, 
yeah, your your opportunity to see things in a in a theatrical setting in a social setting uh, with a group is is limited and always feels like it's any minute could any minute could become even more limited. Uh, and I that's of great concern to me. There's not, you know, there can't be an Alamo Draft House in every small town. Getting something like that off the ground, especially given the costs and limitations of doing first run features just can't yeah. happen everywhere. Um, so yeah, but Bo- Boston is not, I'm not the least bit concerned about Boston as a, as a film hub. It has been for years and years, even with all the, uh, you know, even with all the small cinemas in, in Boston that have closed in the last, you know, 40, 50 years, uh, there's still a lot here and you still have a lot of access to a lot of things that most people just don't. Yeah, no, that it, it is true though. Even just moving to like, I used to live closer to Boston and then I mm-hmm. moved further away and now right. I'm, I don't know if I'm further away distance wise, I'm further away, but I'm right off of route 93. It's easy to get to Boston, but sure, I'm sure. up in New Hampshire. So in this town, I'm in New Hampshire, there's an AMC that they call mm-hmm. a, a classic AMC because it nice. has not been touched in years, but <laughs> it's, it's like, doesn't have the reclining seats. It wasn't upgraded. Right. right. And so, yeah, the, there's a serious lack of access there. Yeah, for sure. Like where they're pretty much just showing like three or four movies that are the most popular stuff. You're not you're not going to get like these indie horror movies like a Terrifier 2 is not coming to this AMC. No, theater. Looks <laughs> like like not, it's, no. it's nope. just not happening. So you do lack access even in areas that are, you know, I'm 30 minutes from Boston and it's like, sure, I have to go to Boston to get that. So it is it is a legitimate concern. And that's why I'd like to see like more. I'd like to see more like libraries put in screening rooms and, Mm -hmm. you know, take advantage of these public spaces. Like people are always like, well, we need events at libraries. And I think these would work like Mm -hmm. screenings and they do them, but like they're usually these mainstream things too. So there's a, uh, there's a theater in Lowell that I really like the Luna theater that does cool oddball stuff. And I've, uh, I don't know if you've done the independent film festival in Boston, but I've done that quite a few years now and that's a lot of fun yeah i've i not since i haven't been i haven't honestly been in the theater more than a handful of times since the pandemic for a variety yeah. of reasons <laughs> Me too. but yeah i mean but between between uh between i mean that festival buff i mean there are all kinds like i think the uh palestinian film festival is either coming soon or just happened but there are film festivals in roxbury i mean we have essentially neighborhood uh, yeah. film festivals in, in Boston. There's no, you know, big, big, small, everything, uh, everything in between you, you have, if you're really interested and want to see things in a group setting in a theatrical setting, you know, and it can be lowercase T not capital T theatrical. I mean, not everyone can afford to rent out a theater or grab, uh, you know, right. get big auditorium, auditorium space in a, in a, in a, on a college campus, something like that. But, you know, these people are always making things. There are always people uh, doing just the most thankless work, putting on smaller festivals and, uh, you know, obtaining, obtaining new films, obtaining independent films, micro budget to be able to assemble uh, festivals for the movie going public and that kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that can happen in smaller locations, but getting traction, you know, yeah. getting getting submissions is not is not always uh, is not always that easy. And you really want to be able to do right by the people who participate in the film festivals, either as you know those are who are submitting or attending. Uh, but yeah. yeah, but there are lots of little theaters s- scattered around New England. New England's got great. Uh, even the metro area, I mean, you, there's a little theater in Dedham, uh, there's the West Newton cinema. Um, and I'm hoping that as I say these names that they're still open and I just didn't like check my, uh, you know, I'm not trying to accidentally thoughts and prayers, uh, uh, a small (laughs) cinema, but you know, even in the, even in the smaller towns around the metro ring, there's lots of opportunity in the metro areas. It's just increasingly fleeting, thin and narrow in lots of other places around the country. Yeah, no, it is. It's tough. And the same goes for, um, for, vid- for video stores. So I am curious, sure. like, you know, what with, 
I mean, it's 2022 now. I could have asked this question in you know 2015, but sure. With or tw- or tw- going- on some on some level 20, 2011. I mean, I think it's yeah. The uh, I think when Netflix by mail probably peaked somewhere 2010, 2011, something like that. And I think yeah. that's kind of that's a weird little understated uh, blow that a lot of the remaining independents and mom and pops took at that time before streaming really came in and started throwing body blows the following, you know, three, four or five years up through today. Uh, but yeah, I think that the, the, the video store as a, as a cultural institution still has value in the abstract as a business. And as something that though people would actively uh, seek out and conduct a business where, you know, you give some money and I take some money, that kind of thing. It's yeah. definitely, I think it's, it's an, it's a niche market for sure. You're, you're drawing in a variety of different kinds of people looking for different kinds of things. It's just a, it's a small, a comparatively smaller pool. Um, there's really, at the end of the day, the convenience and, quote unquote, value for money uh, that streaming provides is just something that no one can match. But I I always tell people that, you know, how do you keep this going? How do you do this? Like, well, I don't I don't know how most brick and mortar anything's, you know, can compete against online shopping. I mean, the yeah. the immediacy of a brick and mortar retail anything, whether it's, you know, it could be electronics it could be kitchenwares it can be toys anything like that you, every brick and mortar is competing with uh some of the biggest companies the world has ever seen in terms of pricing and in terms of convenience and selection and everything like that and i don't really think video stores are that much different i know the uh immediacy of being able to pull something up on your on your streaming device, your, your phone, your tablet, that that's that one step faster than, you know, a couple clicks and your item will be delivered tomorrow. It's just that much more uh, convenient, but it's still the, the idea is you're still competing against major, major, major retailers, huge companies, all kinds yeah. of resources competing against them with anything is, is tough. And it's not something that, uh, I think you've, you've got to, that I think doing retail by itself is, I think it's too hard personally. I, I don't think there's a single retail thing outside of like corner store, liquor store, jewelry store, you know, something where you're selling something that either has a, a, a massive markup um, or, uh, or something that's strictly a convenience based uh, sales yeah. model. I think, I think brick and mortar retail is really hard period. Um, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fair point. I hadn't really thought about it like that before, but I mean, you're totally right. There is a, uh, you know, the same reason that uh, a Barnes and Noble stays in business when Amazon came along it would be the mm-hmm. same reason a video, you know, or, or sure. a local bookstore. It's, you know, I, I think I see it like if record stores can survive and mm-hmm. now there's new record stores opening up sure. and, you know, bookstores did survive and there's lots of great independent bookstores and the big physical brick and mortar chains cut down, but survived Mm -hmm. the, like, you know, I think, yeah, video stores have a spot and they will, they will survive because there, there's something about that. There's something about like being able to walk in and even, even with movies or TV shows where it can be so immediate, sometimes it isn't as easy Mm -hmm to find certain time. And that's where like you, sure. you guys have 17,000. I thought on the website titles. It's, you I know. think it's fit blessed. And it's funny. Cause we keep trying to get a harder number and not include <laughs> like multiples and stuff. The, the, the backstop is I think the it's 15,000 feature films. So I'm pretty sure that's what our letterbox list. We put all of our, uh, our entire catalog up on letterbox. We get a new release or new, uh, acquisition goes up on Letterbox. I think that's around fifteen thousand feature films, something like that, with TV, not, which doesn't count TV miniseries. A whole bunch of like v- a pretty big collection of independent, like undistributed 
customer made local <laughs> things, you know, yeah. that kind of don't, you know, probably exist maybe like on a, uh, on a like defunct YouTube channel or something like that. That doesn't count. So basically that's what, what letterbox has are the, are the things that letterbox has that we have. And I'm pretty sure that numbers up around 15,000. 15. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, but that doesn't count a whole bunch of other things, uh, that we also, that we also have, but I think that's a good backstop number in terms of discs. It's way, 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 way more than that. But you know, we want to yeah, represent the multiples. titles and right. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, even, kind of you know, 15,000 titles and you look at like, so Netflix, the average, they have like 3,500, 4,000. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it's really, a, it's a, third it's, a it's a pittance compared. Yeah, absolutely. Even, even, yeah. and they do, and the, the, the big streaming companies do a really good job of kind of like masking how much they have. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The number of, uh, the number of titles, titles, titles uh, that I think Netflix, HBO Max, and Hulu. I think if you grouped all that together, you're 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 at a much smaller number than you would think. Um, yeah. Well, and that's the and the crazy thing too is that you now need you need Netflix, HBO Max, Disney Plus, Paramount mm-hmm. Plus, mm-hmm. Hulu. You need the you know the Criterion Channel, the Arrow Video Channel. The you know there's there's Shutter. It's right. like at a certain point. You're they reassembled. Second, they reassembled cable. It, right, you're adding a yeah. second cable bill yeah. while still, you know, <laughs> still paying for your cable, and it's like, unless somebody can come together and make the Am, and even Amazon couldn't do this with Prime Video, but unless somebody can consolidate everything, like Amazon can do that, and retail stores can do that, where you can carry every book publishing company, right. and they're all under one roof. And you just can't, you can't do that with streaming because everybody wants their own platform and everybody has their originals that they want you to sign up for. And I think the number is just going to keep getting diluted. Like it's going to be less and less of the stuff, especially on a Netflix or an Amazon or a Hulu. Like it's going to be less and less. Well, yeah, we've got a whole catalog of Warner movies. It's like, Mm -hmm. no, those are on HBO. What you have is a whole catalog of Netflix originals and Hulu originals and you've lost the rights to everything else. Right. And so as, as this sort of cycles through, unless somebody comes in and buys everybody up and says, okay, we're building a streaming platform that's just going to be the hub, then I think, you know, that's where it, it gets even more important to have to have access and to have options. Right. But that's kind of, I mean, but, but the problem with that is the, you know, is the benevolent monarch problem like yeah if we can just get yeah. everything under one one roof but the right. company that does that is super cool and really receptive to you know the interests of the customers yeah. they don't you know exist. i mean yeah and if someone's like <laughs> well why doesn't amazon just buy everything like you think that's the answer for amazon to just own all yeah. the rights to all this stuff like i mean there's there's pros and cons to streaming having gotten more and more balkanized over the last uh, you know, three, five years, I guess, with everyone wants their own platform. Everyone wants their own original content to go with it. Everyone wants a little piece of, you know, Warner. Everyone wants to kind of pick and choose uh, their little stable of back catalog films to pair with their uh, original content, which is where this always goes. Uh, that's that's great. I, it's good for the consumer in that it's not everything under one roof and things can, uh, not everyone's controlling one thing and there's space in the market for new companies and new services and new ideas. But as these things go away, as they get swallowed up, um, I mean, I'm the, the one I watch the, the, the thing I'm most curious about right now is what ends up happening with uh, Tubi and when they go original content or when they monetize hard or when they, when Fox just kind of folds them into another thing yeah, you know it's it's neat being able to watch insane, you know VHS trash from 1987. You right. know, insert your favorite title here. You know, with the ads and the ads, you know, ads feel free. Um, how you view free, I guess, kind of depends. Um, but I don't think that's going to last forever because there's no reason to think it would last right. uh, forever. If to be at some point is getting enough eyeballs and they think they can. Uh, Fox, and I'm pretty. Is it Fox outright that owns Tubi? I'm fairly sure. 
Um, if you want to check that while well, I talk yeah. slowly to fill in. <laughs> Let's the Fox Fox Corporation owns Tubi, which I guess right. now means. So does that mean Disney owns it, or I, is that the part of? I think it's the part of Fox that wasn't acquired by Disney, right? That might be right. I mean, the I don't know. It has the the news and like, right. Fox still has Fox Corporation. I think that's who owns it. Right. Irregardless. And I use that word on purpose. It's one of my favorites to throw out. <laughs> uh, I, that's one of my favorite not word words to use. Uh, but the uh, but the reality is that at some point, if if there's a dollar to turn and if yeah. there's a way to scoop up that content and do something more or better with it, even something that might be better for consumers writ large, it, the, the content will be moved. The, the rights will be shifted around contracts yeah. will be signed. There's no, there's no telling where these things are going to end up. And when I say could end up, that could mean straight ghosted. I mean, things can vanish yeah. in a heartbeat and there's no, there's really not much you can do about it. I mean, people are, the rights holders can sit on it. They can say kick rocks. They can say, you know, I'm going to wait for a better offer. I'm going to see if I can take my IP and get together with some other people and we'll do some hyper niche thing for, you know, campy horror stuff or for yeah. no budget alien adventures. It, it, you just really have no way of, of knowing with, with streaming. And I think it's, also to re- important to remember that streaming se- is so standard now, but it's still really new. Uh, yeah. This concept of uh, on-demand play, whether it's music, movies, anything else, I think there's still a lot that's going to evolve from this, and there could be some good with it. There could be some bad with it, but the idea that what you have yeah. access to on your TV on your device at this very minute, uh, you could expect to have comparable options at comparable prices five years from now. I don't think that's, I don't think that's kind of where this goes. Cause I had a question I did want to ask about the, the, the library and like what's being rented out. Um, I'm curious if you have stats sure. on that. So, I mean, most, mo- <laughs> most store stats live comfortably between my Perfect. ears. Uh, in terms the catalog the catalog that we maintain i think is is wide ranging and kind of fulsome by design we do not lean super hard into just deep cuts into just obscurities the the idea of the catalog at least as far as i'm concerned is to be a resource and an archive and a backstop. Um, I don't think we're doing anyone any favors by leaning hard into a genre Mm -hmm. to getting super, super, super niche. Uh, I think it's important that we have homeward bound and homeward bound too. (laughs) in the same way. I think it's important for us to have, you know, all the Halloween movies. I don't think getting, uh, and every now and again, someone will come in and they'll expect us to have uh, sort of a complete, a completest section for something that I would consider to be very niche. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we don't have thousands mm-hmm. of a certain thing. Outside of you know movies, English language, non English language, stuff like yeah. that, uh, it would be easy for us to pick a lane uh, and run really hard at it, and kind of abandon mainstream releases, to abandon family films, to abandon uh, you know documentaries, which are getting harder and harder to find anyway, because most of them, the, the few that do get uh, physical media releases, are much smaller. Um, and much less well traveled. That those are the kind of things that I think streaming makes the most sense for, actually, yeah. um, because they're they're so they're comparatively cheap to make, and you can find uh, 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 the niche audience that much that much right. easier. Uh, 
but I, but we do have, I always say we have every decade, every genre, every language. There are things that we would love to have, uh, as part of the catalog that, you know, we will eventually we'll get to getting things hot off the presses for some reissues is important. Other things it's not as important, but we're always filling in gaps. We always want to have things that are hard to see elsewhere, uh, or that are quote unquote unstreamable, uh, whatever that means in today's day and age. Uh, but yeah, I think the, the approach is if you can't find it online, check us out. If you find yourself spending 70, 80 bucks a month to kind of complete all the, uh, movie watching habits you have in all of your, uh, genre decade language interests, we're here for that also. Uh, but yeah, we keep, for some people, we're, we're a red box with a front door, you know, every week, like bullet train, nope, the week before something, I just, those are, those are yeah. two of the new popular titles, uh, but, but not really, they're not peeking over the new release rack where the director wall is and be like, Ooh, what Hal Ashby movie haven't I seen? <laughs> there are people that just do not give a crap about any of our back catalog. There are back catalog offerings there are also people who don't really look at the new release rack much at all because they're marching through their Cronenberg. They're marching through Fritz Long. They're marching through Bergman. And that's what we offer them as a customer. Right. We have a bunch of families where it's one for the kids, one for the adults. So the kids will watch Tro- Trolls World Tour again <laughs> while the parents check out uh, a new release or, you know, something they've been meaning to see. We have a bunch of people who pick up subscriptions seasonally. October is a good time for people to... Uh, pick up a month or uh, or a three month for and scoop in maybe some of the holiday releases yep. uh, that they won't be able to find elsewhere. So the catalog is is supposed to be uh, user friendly. It's supposed to be broad. Uh, we're not here to kind of snob out on people. Uh, we're not interested in making people feel dumb for not knowing a variety of titles yeah. i don't think that makes sense for a variety of reasons uh but the but the breadth of the catalog even if it doesn't go as deep as some people might prefer uh is is really important i think that's a a key to long-term viability also is not is not going great guns on one thing uh or another although the, the temptation for that is is certainly there yeah. But I think if you're doing something this niche, being as broad as possible and saying, yes, you have something that's certainly not an art house classic while having some of those art house classics that someone else is seeking out. I think that's I think that's where I think that's where the sweet spot is, honestly, is is yeah. in is in breadth and not hyper special hyper specialization. No, I would agree. Yeah. And you keep it. It, that keeps it accessible for anybody. You're not doing any gatekeeping of, you know, cause I think, I think there could be, it's weird, but there is some intimidation, I think for some people to go into certain film spaces and feel like I don't, I don't know about Bergman. And so I should, I shouldn't go in there. Someone's going to ask me about a movie I haven't right. seen and I'm going to look like an idiot and, you know, it, th- there can be intimidation in some of those. I mean, I feel I feel like I've seen lots of movies. I feel that going into a film festival where it's like these people know everything, and I and I don't. <laughs> right. And I'm here to learn more and watch more. But you know, there is intimidation. So keeping it accessible is important, and I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Versus going too art house or too main. You go too mainstream, then you're just you know, then you're just blockbuster. But you know, it, right. you, there's a middle ground where you don't have to be the super niche art house. You know, like I can, I can even picture it. Like there's just like no lights on and like one guy at the counter and it's like, you know, just kind of like an intimidating place to be. Um, and I, I, I think it's fascinating how that kind of video store clerk trope thing persists. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how, especially even among the, we have, we have customers who are, who are, born this millennium yeah. and even they're like oh well, i didn't want you know i don't want to say something dumb like i don't give a crap if you say something dumb like i'm not going to tell you your taste is bad or that you're looking for stupid movies or something like that like i just don't i know that that was a thing 
but that was a thing before some of these kids were born and it stopped being a thing when they were, you know, in diapers. I just don't <laughs> yeah. understand why that's, I mean, it's, you know, if you're, if your expectation going into any business is abysmal customer service, right. I mean, come on, like it's that's not, not and I know people think that it's kind of, kind of neat. Like, oh yeah, I told him what my favorite movie was and he grumbled and turned his back to me. Like, I don't think that's, no. I, I don't know. I, I, the, what was it? The, it was the last season of Stranger Things. They had to go to the video, to go to family video of all places, yeah. which I thought was a laugh riot. Uh, and uh, as someone who pay, who is a, a frequent family video customer, uh, being being from the Midwest and uh, and knowing what uh, fa- the the family video experience was was all about, and then the guy being a clown for no reason. I mean, I know it's played for laughs, but people really do still think that when they come up and ask for a movie, and it's um, do you, um, there's a movie called, um, uh, she's the man. I'm like, yeah, we got, she's the man. We're watching <laughs> on the, on the store TV, like, like a week ago. Like that's, yeah, we're not I'm like, Oh, you're watching that. Yeah. Huh? Well, maybe uh, if you see your Jimbo first, like no one talks like that. I hate that crap. I'm sorry. I know I'm just kind of no, but that digressing is. now, but that, but the idea that the, that the, the person at the video store is supposed to be rude, um, I really well, it's funny because that I don't think I don't think no one's supposed to be that rude. person has now moved online and they're the ones that tell you on Twitter that your opinion sucks. <laughs> and, but but you'd <laughs> never catch them in person because right yeah, it's it's funny how it used to like I feel like the internet used to be a more open space where you could be accessible when like early days internet it was like there's all these niche communities and like you could find people with common interests and you can still do that and then you go to a video store. And there was that trope of like, this guy's going to make fun of you because you're like, she's the man. And now it's like flipped. Now right. It's like, if I say like, I'm looking for this movie on Twitter, they're going to be like, you're an idiot. Why don't you watch something that's like more serious and, you know, traditional. And, and then you go to the video store and you guys are like, oh my God, yeah, we have that movie. That movie rocks. Like, yeah, I, I, I mean, and it's, there's, there's definitely like pre clout internet, pre social media internet and post. Yeah. Um, I think there's there's a lot of and I don't do film Twitter really and I, I mean I don't have the You're time or the patience or the inclination like I get to have actual conversations about movies with real human beings and talking about movies yeah. in for me is usually pleasant and a positive experience and I know that's not the case for a lot of other people who are afraid of saying they don't like something or they thought something was lame or even offensive or everyone's worried about getting shouted down. If you kind of jump into a thread, uh, you know, I, I don't have a whole lot of patience or interest in that whatsoever. I know people who really enjoy that. And I know people who have become good friends with people through social media, talking about films, talking about actors, directors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's awesome. But the, but that murky water you have to wade through to find, you know, some, some, some buddies does, doesn't always seem worth it. And it's awful seeing people get shouted down or called stupid or the petitions or the, you know, insert word dash bros here. I, I, it's, it's a, it's a huge bummer, but it's, it's not as much a, movie thing to me is it is a social media yeah, thing because you can pick any hobby or interest and find the exact same kind of behavior oh, yeah. uh being exhibited on, on any number of yeah. social media platforms music, so i think that's more of an music, internet video games, more yeah i think it's more sports. of an, I mean, yep. yeah it's yep. it's the same yep. everywhere it's more of an internet problem than uh than a than a movie yeah. problem i think but but i feel like movies are something that are that i mean that's something that's so so broad and universal. Right. I mean, not everyone is way into hockey, but there are more people who will watch a movie this month than a hockey game. So for people who are really getting interested in something that you can really dive into to no end and then to get kind of clapped at for, you know, for saying that they like something or they dislike something or they didn't understand why something was good. That's, that's always a bummer. So I usually, I kind of stay away from that stuff as much. As oh I no, can. you're, you're better off. Um, so I, I did want to ask where are you guys, how, how are you sourcing all the titles? Where's it all coming from into the store? Um, we get new releases through, uh, one of the two, at least as far as I know, two big, U.S. wholesalers 
left. We, we basically get most a lot of things through Alliance. Yeah. Um, mostly for new releases, they beat Street Date. The prices are fine. We're not buying dozens and dozens of new releases every month. We're mostly keeping up with, uh, um, you know, the, the things that people want to see, grabbing titles here and there, as long as we make kind of our order minimums. Uh, there's not a ton of, and most of the time, if there's not enough, I mean, we've got kind of like a set budget for uh, what we spend on physical media every month. If the new releases aren't there, the way they often are not during the summer, when I'm like, man, yeah. there's like, nothing nothing like i want to put something on the new release rack and there's just nothing there then we'll we'll divert that budget to a, a bigger criterion buy we'll uh we often check for sales just retail sales because a lot of times those sales are actually competitive or even beating what's listed as a uh, as a wholesale price mm-hmm. uh, we're never since we're never buying in volume volume yeah. uh the price we get on new releases is is very much in line with the kind of threadbare margins that a lot of the bigger retailers get. Uh, but if there's a sale, if there's a, you know, if indicators doing a sale, if, if Severin's doing a sale, Vincent's doing a sale, we're, we're kind of open to grabbing whatever we think is good. Kino, uh, if Kino Lorber is doing a sale and the, and the price is right. And it's a title that we think we should have in the catalog. Uh, you know, we go for it. Uh, there are other distributors uh, who carry things at probably comparable prices. Um, we would always rather buy uh, label direct if possible. Sometimes the order minimums just don't make sense for us since we're, and I think we're kind of in a, for some of the, for some of the labels and some of the imprints, the us, our place as a just a video store and not really like a video retailer it's weird because we're never looking to buy 10 of a thing and i'm sure they're thinking that when they sell to uh a brick and mortar they're thinking okay so you'll want you know maybe five of this and five of this and five of this i'm like i'm looking for two yeah right and, and then all of a sudden meet, meeting their order minimums doesn't make much sense. And that's why we end up getting a lot of things through Alliance that we would happily buy from uh, Labels Direct. But the it doesn't make sense to them to sell us a movie at a wholesale price with really not much behind it. Uh, but yeah, Alliance is the source for most of our new stuff, but we're always looking at other places. We're always willing to have conversations with uh, labels and distributors, uh, all that kind of stuff. I'm still trolling eBay to fill in gaps for all sorts of things. Uh, You know, it's, it's really no, it's really no, no different than any other. I don't, on some level, I don't think we're that much different than any other physical media collector. That's what it sounds like. Outside of the fact that we've got, yeah, we've got, uh, we've got, a slightly different mission yeah. uh, and what we're hoping to accomplish and what we collect is not necessarily things that a person likes or is not reflected in uh, my personal uh, film tastes, but the tastes of uh, a whole bunch of people who are current customers or maybe will become customers uh, down the road. And when they show up looking for that thing, we have that thing because you know, I thought it was important to have that thing at some point in the past. Yeah, so you've got the, you've got the collector mindset, which helps when those types of people yes. come in. You, you kind yeah, of guess what yeah. they're going to be looking for and what's popular. Mm-hmm. Um, so what yeah. is the what is the uh, say someone's local? They want to come in. What's the deal? What are the deals? How do you how do you sign up? What's the uh, what's the kind of process? Because I don't think it's it's a little bit different than like. Yeah, you just anybody, you know, walks in a blockbuster, right? Like you guys have sort of a subscription service where you you set up different tiers, right? Right. right. It's a it's a subscription model. It's all like flat fee, unlimited swap. Uh so the the base rate, the plan most people are on are two titles out at a time with unlimited exchanges for twenty bucks a month. Um there's all kinds of perks. I mean, it makes you eligible for the member screenings. It waves the base fee on running out the screening room. You know, there's price breaks on three months, six months, and uh, annual. There's some other tiers with more perks and more swag stuff, shirts and mugs and all that, all that 
crap um and uh tiers that allow you to bring more people to the uh subscriber screenings that kind of things so there are some people that are that split split household uh on a larger membership there are some people who just get the four at a time because they can only get to the shop a couple times a month they want to make sure they're getting their fix for whatever they're uh whatever they're looking for or whatever their watching project is right. Uh, that kind of thing. But yeah, but you get to determine the value for money. We don't do late fees. You know, if you hold movies past your date, it just, you know, renews itself, that kind of thing. Um, the whole late fee, we, we switched to f- subscription only, I think in 2017. Uh, and it's been great. Not having to track people down, not having to worry about, I mean, the worst, the worst thing back in the day was someone coming in with two movies that are like two weeks late and they're like, yeah, I didn't get to watch either of these. And it's like, Oh, (laughs) that sucks. Like I don't want people to not, you know, watch what they checked out or have one of these life gets in the way situations where all of a sudden, you know, they feel kind of, and it makes, I always got the impression that they felt like we're kind of doing them dirty a little bit by, you know, taking the money for the movies and then taking the late fee and right. all that stuff. I think, I think so much of what we consume in terms of media or anything else is subscription based subscription model now that it only kind of makes sense and it lets people, yeah, determine what they do with it. I mean, there are people that come in three or four times a week and swap movies out. There are people we see maybe a couple times a month. Most people probably come in once, maybe twice uh, twice a week, but there's never any, it never gets punitive or weird. Um, you know, do people hang on to some things too long? Sure. But if they're spending 20 bucks to hang on to that stuff, that's usually an incentive to obtain another copy or maybe, well, the DVD of this has been out for a couple months, you know, let's get the Blu-ray, let's get another DVD, something, something like that. Uh, so there's always, a way for people to leverage the the membership, the subscription to the hilt, but there's also a way for people to use it and not feel like uh, they're they're wasting money or that they're getting kind of boned somehow yeah. on uh, on on the whole thing. Yeah, no, that I, I think I mean I like the model at twenty bucks unlimited swaps, two movies at a time. I mean, sure. what's that? That's what uh, that's what Netflix costs. I mean, you know, it's not at this point, you know, you pretty much have access. Yeah. To, I don't think it's, I don't think it's cost prohibitive. No, it's, I think, seems fair again, I, I mean, I yeah. would have even expected yeah. more, but so that's, that seems fair and you get all those perks too. So yeah, I think that's a pretty good deal. So yeah. if you're, if you're in the area, I would say go for it for sure. You must get a lot of like, do stu- you get a lot of like students too in college? There's so many college There's- kids around that area. There's always some Emerson students yeah. that there's always, I mean, there's always some film students. There's always some, uh, yeah, there's always some f- film school, you know, something there's the, the cast of characters that make up our subscriber base varies wildly in terms of interest in film, in terms of background in film. Uh, I mean, we've had, we have, filmmakers we have film instructors we have film students we have just regular old doctors and architects and dishwashers and you know artists and i mean it there's really not people like what does you know kind of what is a what is a typical vu customer like media subscriber look like yeah. and i doesn't really i always have a really hard time with that because i'll even you know, I've done phone interviews or people have sent emails to, you know, like, here's the questions I'm going to ask. And I'll look and I'll like a, who rented movies the day before. And I'm like, you know, I can't, anyone. I can't turn this into a, a like an archetype. It just doesn't, yeah. it doesn't work. Most people, we do tend to get more film buffs, I guess. Uh, if you look at what's checked out at a given time, uh, you know, it's not just fast and furious movies and sure. you know people like you know clamoring for a chance to watch top gun maverick i mean we have copies of that on order it'll do it'll check out very well but at the end of the year in and year out uh new release rentals do not dwarf back catalog rentals by any stretch of the imagination Interesting. and you do see an ebb and flow in terms of 
uh, what's, I mean, what, what is available on kind of the larger streaming platforms absolutely informs what people, uh, are checking out at a given, at a given time, but there's really not a time when, uh, there's very rarely am I in a position where I suddenly ran out of a new release and there was only one thing people wanted to see and there was nothing else. And they just had to watch this one thing. Uh, I think the last time it got close to happening was probably everything everywhere all at once. But you know, we add a few more copies to the next order and you know, there's always something else to watch. There's always something else. People always have their lists. Uh, It's that's what makes, I think, the video store experience today so much different from the, I still maintain highly regrettable blockbuster days. Um, as an aside, I know, I know they're doing the show and I know it's kind of become this revived pop culture thing. Yeah. Blockbuster was always terrible. It was always terrible. It was terrible when it put the mom and pops out of business. It was terrible when, you could reserve like your new copy of the new thing. It always, it was always bad anyway, but yeah, <laughs> where it's not, everything's not new release driven yeah. because the new stuff that you want to watch isn't on physical media. Anyway, the zeitgeist stuff is not at the video right. store. You were, you were, you were waiting when Top Gun Maverick comes out, you had six months to go see that in the theater. You know, it's clearly, it was not a, you want to see it. You've been interested in seeing it, but it was not so, uh, it was not such a pressing matter that you, uh, you know, I mean, you've, you, that movie was in the theater for so yeah. long. If you were desperate to see Top Gun, you would have. So for most people who are coming in here, they'd like to keep up with the new releases around Oscar season. That's usually when there's a little bit more uh, pressure. Cause at that point people may have missed something that was only in the theater, even in Boston for six, yeah. eight weeks tops, maybe comes back for a, a two, three week, uh, you know, swan song leading up to the awards themselves. But, uh, but yeah, there's never, there's never a time where something is so hot or people only want to see one thing. Uh, when, when someone dies, that's often where there's a little bit more pressure to see a certain, a certain thing with a certain person. But even then, uh, that's that, that doesn't happen all that often where some legendary figure dies and there's only two or three, they're only in two or three things that anyone wants to see. And honestly, those are, we're not leveraging someone's misfortune, but when, when there are times, there have been times when someone uh, pass, someone of note passes the three or four things they're most well known for uh, are gone, but it gives me a chance to be like, well, I actually had a pretty, a bigger career than that they're actually in a, a, a wider variety of things yeah. they were they did a bunch of uk films in the 70s they did a, a bunch of bizarre indie films in the early 90s that that kind of thing is you know allows for some teachable moments yeah. too no it's interesting it's interesting i would love to i'm gonna have to i'm gonna come down at some point and check it out it's an excellent idea sure. you have a you have a, you have yourself a cold brew yep. you can look at the you re- read the back of our uh uh, copy of something and uh, taking the taking the sights and yeah, sounds. No, absolutely, <laughs> something if like that. Any of you guys listen? If you're in the area, I mean, go go check it out. Just stop in, even if you know, just grab a coffee and walk around. Who knows? Maybe you end up a subscriber. But I mean, that's it's hard to beat for the price. I mean, you can't get that value with streaming anymore. So you know who's. Who's to say that, that the, that's going to be a better and better deal as time goes on because these things are getting so fractured and you guys have this this library. Yep. I mean, I uh, yeah. I believe in it. I think it's going to come come back and I think it's going to keep... It's never going to be mainstream. It's never going to be what it was, but it has its place and it's not dead like everyone thinks it is. It's there and it's it's important. And, and I and I would say that the, the the biggest barrier going forward, I know people still think that that streaming just eventually leans out. It's going to be access to the physical media yeah. as an artifact that does us in. Yeah. If and when that that time comes, it's not going to be because no one wants DVDs anymore. It's not going to be because uh, some there's some kind of like mega streaming conglomerate that you know ends up 
patchwork creating a a standalone service that's that's so good that there's no point in having anything else anymore. It's going to be because the the means of actually manufacturing and fabricating the disc themselves will cease to be viable. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that's the, the thing that I worry about or that the, uh, there's not, uh, a suitable or palatable, uh, device being made with an optical drive. I mean, your ability to play a disc in the same way, your ability to play a tape or a record yeah. is not what it uh, used to be. Most of the time when people are looking for, uh, new, uh, new devices, they go to places that don't carry thing. I mean, 4k players are out, uh, Hard to find, and though. in production, but not easy to yeah. find. Uh, same thing with, I mean, PlayStation 5s are not easy to find. You still have older game consoles, and it's not hard to find a random DVD player on Craigslist or at a thrift store or something like that. But as time goes on, if these things are not being produced and even very tiny M mass produced, that will have a much more uh, harmful effect on the viability of physical media than just than just streaming. I think that I think that battle i think that phase of this has kind of played itself out in a weird way the physical media has its collectors yeah. there's a market for it institutionally um and uh commercially i don't think that's the thing anymore i think things not being available i think the i think the plants that manufacture these things not being numerous uh plays plays a role in the potential inevitable eventual uh demise of physical media of all kinds yeah. uh when i and when i say physical media i really mean top to bottom i think lps cassettes i think any sort of physical media that's not tied to uh you know an internet connection uh is i think it's i think it's one one boat with books maybe being the exception but i think I think even mass produced books could suffer a, a similar, a similar fate to um, records, DVDs, Blu-rays, 4Ks, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. No, I mean, it's, it is, it's kind of, it's already happening. There's only like two plants in the whole mm. U S that even make this stuff or maybe even one right. and one in Mexico that does a lot of the work. Yeah. I mean, it's, we've, we've all seen the, we've all seen the, the Mexico, dot line was to say made yeah, in mexico, mexico or manufactured I mean, mexico it's, yeah. it's the only place they can get it done now and mm-hmm. they're pretty much the only ones left um yeah i mean mm-hmm. it's the idea of optical media for sure will go away i think eventually i mean will it go completely away i don't know like will it disappear off the face of the earth only if the technology disappears but even like i, I do think about vinyl records and i think like maybe if there's somebody who's passionate, like Jack White has his own like pressing plant where he makes vinyl records. Sure. So like, and there are, and there are smaller, there are smaller vinyl. I mean, it's not, it's, it's much easier to, to do that. And there, there have been in the U S in the last few years, a few of those things that have cropped up. It's just much more difficult Unfortunately, it's shrink to, yeah. production sizes. It's <laughs> going to shrink how many are out there. You're going to have limited editions of almost everything because they just can't make a hundred thousand mm-hmm. of these. But I could totally see that happening for movies where, like the, you know, like Scorsese and his foundation or something would be like, well, we want to maintain this, so we're going to set up a small little place that makes discs, and you buy them from this, you know, mm-hmm. just like Jack White did or like the Coppola you know, his team in the restorations, they do like someone's going to take it and do it, right. but it's not going to be showing up at Walmart target. Right. Even Best Buy. No. Like they're, they're gone. So then it has to go to either online retailers or the mom and pop places that want to keep these things alive. Just like vinyl. I mean, yeah, sure. Now you can find like Taylor Swift's vinyl record in target, but it's like, that's pretty much it. I mean, that the, not one's mass produced because, of who she is, but like you're not going to find the because it's got yeah it's got her it's got her picture yeah on. you're not going to find most yeah I mean like it's like it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a fan collectible that's it's all not it a, is. yeah it's not right. a, yeah and so yeah. you'll you'll still see some of that but yeah for like you know these labels like Kino or Vinegar like they're going to have to 
sort of like branch out on their own and start to like replicate and manufacture discs or th- these things are going to be gone. So it'd be interesting to see like who, who adapts, where does it go? But I mean, at some point with the way storage is going, like optical media is just not the best way to store files anyway. So there's going to mm-hmm. be a point in time where it's like whatever the equivalent is in 15 or 20 years of a USB drive that can hold hundreds and hundreds of movies and you don't even have to worry mm-hmm. about file size. Like that'll be your new your new mm-hmm. physical media. Will be like in the the kaleidoscape. Like that sort of like download an, an uncompressed file somewhere. So it's sure. like streaming. You don't need an internet connection to watch it. But like it's right. not going to be a disc and a player. It's going to be high quality delivered in a in a different way. Like I, I just that's the way I see it going. I, I guess, I mean, I can see that, I can see that as a possibility. My, my thought on that is the, I, I don't, I don't think storage is going to explode in that kind of way, um, at that kind of scale. And I still think that the, the trapping of that is the, being dis it not being internet connected and that internet connection not going to a server farm that will always have way more capacity than anything you can hold uh in your hand i think files are an important part i'm trying to think of how to say this without without running my face into it (laughs) The, the the problem in trafficking the problem in trafficking files whether it's peer to peer whether it's torrenting anything like that is that you're still beholding you're still you're still you're still relying on non rights holders and I know I know and if you're thinking of some kind of thing where you like you get like you you cut a student you know like there's a little thumb drive and it says a twenty four on it and you plug it in it's got all the a twenty four movies something like that there's there has to be a viable business model there has to be a viable commercial exchange to make that a reality i don't know what that is i know that making a disc for x dollars and selling it for x plus five x plus seven i know that those are real small numbers but i know that that model makes sense i also know that part of what makes physical media appealing to a lot of people i mean i see people gripe about blu-ray covers and how the you know you know i i i i really like the essay and the liner notes like just having the thing and owning it is part of this but the what kept lps alive through the 90s and into the early 2000s had a lot less to do with audio quality as much as lp people love to say warm guitars etc etc you want to be able to hold something in your hands you want to be able to collect it you want it to be something that's yours files are never gonna do that um i think the way to keep physical media available and active is to have some sort of control over the means of production every time i see a gofundme for you know, some, like you were saying about the reshoot cut something, yeah. What you know, people will give 20 bucks to remake Batman doing something I don't even know anymore. Uh, if you could somehow harness that, the harness the collectors and harness their interest and energy into, and it's a lot of money. And I know these, these physical plants are not, it's not, tens of thousands of dollars to kind of wrangle the means of production it's considerably more than that but if you were able to to do something like that and get the means of production i think there are enough an optical drive device is not that expensive to make and it's not that expensive to replace um but the creation of the media itself is the real fly in the ointment because that's the upfront cost that a studio is yeah. uh sinking that uh that a label is sinking being able to kind of grease the groove on that makes a lot more sense to me 
but that's ultimately the biggest the biggest impediment is no one wants to put that money up front to create something that only a few thousand people maybe at most a few tens of thousands of people for certain things but but that's that's where yeah. this all gets jammed up as it stops being viable and i think giving people access to really uncompressed huge files to be able to uh plug into a thing i don't even know what that thing you plug into is at a certain point though i mean I, there's there's layers yeah, there's have, like, there's the media itself yeah that yeah i mean it's the then you're talking then you're talking about getting a right media server and stuff. but it's going to be it's going to be something that's yeah. got right well, i mean a server with with very pricey like i mean do you have like a like a graphics card array i mean to process these huge files yeah i mean that's that's well, kind of where i mean the internet is it's it's effective and it's really simple and it's very streamlined to just you know hit the button on Moroku. i got some options and i don't have yeah. to worry about any of that stuff cuz i'm not, if i'm not that worried about my if i'm not super worried about the selection or if i'm willing to kind of you know, eat what's put in front of me a little bit. And I heard the show's good. And I heard someone at work talking about a new series or something like that. I mean, that's, it's what what is set up for consumers right now is very good. What's set up for movie people is not. Yeah. Um, and whether there are enough movie people out there, uh, I think that's kind of, I think a lot of things are going to be lost and a, a good number of people are going to care, but not enough people to really move the needle at the end of the day. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I hope that I don't want it to go the way of file because then you get into, then you become video games where you're yes. just, di- and, and there's, there's the DRM and then they decide to shut the server down or stop supporting the game. Mm-hmm. And then you, you're left there with literally, you can't play without an internet connection to a server and you're left right. with nothing, which would terrify me about movies is, yeah, you have a thumb drive or you download these files, whatever they wanted to push on you because they don't want you to own anything. Everything needs to be no. rented. Housing, right. cars, borrowed. everything is borrowed for a short amount of time. <laughs> That's the way they want the economy yep. to work. So, yes. yeah, you take these things and you'd have them for a year. Then A24 would sell the rights to somebody else. And then your thumb drive would be useless. So I hope it doesn't yep. go that way. I think what you said, like there's a manufacturing on demand part of this, which mm-hmm. could wor- or could a pre. Work. I mean, if you control if you control the means of production, you would be you would be able to, I think, maintain the the niche market, yeah. and it'll always be niche. This is never going to no. be this is never going to be mass consumer product ever again, yep. and that's fine. But I think if you controlled the means of production, you'd be able to keep it going and maybe keep it going in a uh, uh, a relatively sustainable way, almost indefinitely. Well, that's what I was thinking. But it, yeah, if you, yeah, but it takes but it takes having the plant. It takes right. having the. If you can get the plant, yeah, and you can sustain yourself long enough to pay off the plant and all the machinery you had to buy and everything Mm -hmm. get past that point where all you then have is just like your overhead and stuff. Then you can do Mm -hmm. manufacturing on demand almost, you know, whatever it costs. If it's, Hey, you need to go to this website, order it for $30 and in five months they'll be shipped out because we're taking orders for two. They get 10,000 orders, $30 a piece. They make them, they ship out 10,000. Like it's hard to it's hard right. to lose doing that because you have the money up front. Right. So you could keep doing that yeah. literally forever as long as someone's willing to put the upfront investment into maintaining the plant and getting it yeah. off the ground. So that yeah. is hopefully I mean, where as it time goes. Yeah. and but there would absolutely have to be something in terms of devices like optical yeah. drive devices sort of woven into this also. Right. Um, that gets a little that gets trickier um because so few i mean there are the number of factories in the world that produce consumer electronics guts is really small yeah. um and everyone knows about chips and all the electronics supply chain issues yeah. we have dealt with over the last few years um but i think that's 
that is something that you could, I think that's much easier to create a workaround or not have to keep that all under one roof the way you kind of have to keep the physical media manufacturing all under, all under one roof. Yeah. But it's still going to take it, but it's like, like we talked about with the, you know, if there was one, one, one streaming service to rule them all and everything was in one place, so whoever is in charge of that has to have good intentions right. or at least has to um, have skipped the part in economics about how you can leverage a monopoly. <laughs> and I think you would probably have yeah. to do the same for the physical media plan yeah. to make sure that, you know, you're not just, just kind of gouging people or having uh, being kind of duplicitous with uh, with the costs up the associated costs and the upfront costs right. um, for a lot of these things. If it could be run, if it could be run as a collective and if you could negotiate uh, licensing rights with, with big studios and with uh, you know, individual rights holders and kind of a, a justice minded and kind of an economically minded way that would be fantastic. And that's kind of maybe the best, the best case scenario. It's sort of happened, but as long as, War- yeah, I mean, War- it's there Warner are and universal there are ways, it, which was interesting because they right. now crank out, they crank out a lot of stuff more so than others yeah. because they just were like, this doesn't make sense for either of us to try to do on our own. Make studio distribution yeah. services. We team up together. You still have your own catalogs, but everything just comes out of the same house now. And it's worked right. for them. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's what will happen. But, like, Disney will never do that because they need to be, you know, unless they scoop everybody else and buy them up. Like, they're not going to team up with somebody else right. and say, yeah, let's be no. friends. The mouse has no friends. So, must got yeah. no friends. So yeah, it, that is it is sort of happening. It's the way it's going. But like, yeah, you need good intentions from people, which is right. Very and you hard. need and you and you need and you need people to uh, to be okay with the idea that not every industry is a growth industry, and that the uh, making a making an amount of money that looks like a uh, looks like a a straight horizontal line, but just has a very slight up tilt to yeah. it is, is, is okay. Um, that you're not, that you're, the market is, the market is largely set from the jump. And if you can grow it incrementally over time, that's great. Um, but if it's, but if it functions more as just any other sort of manufacturing business, um, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of okay too. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure there's someone out there who makes candles and they don't spend all of their time thinking about how they can get more candles into people's homes. Right. They just want to produce quality candles uh, and provide excellent candle products and candle related services. And that's awesome because they like what they do. And it's, exactly. you know, it's, it's what they've, it, it's the path they've as chosen. As long as it's viable um, and there's still customers like it will, it will still happen, but right. it's yeah, it's not going to happen at the scale it's been happening. Right, and it, and it's and it's not gonna and it's the 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 life of the life of physical media is not going to be determined by a lack of interest in movies as a concept, right. or there's no lack of interest in f- existing IP. I don't think or content as it's currently being created. It's mostly the the nuts and bolts of of are there enough dollars in this to make it worth yeah. uh, worthwhile and for a lot of companies, distributors, studios, etc. The answer is no, but there are maybe enough people out there to to keep that kind of thing uh, going. I just think that the the odds of the benevolent overlord being a physical media person are way, it's way better than the, that than, than on the streaming side. That's I think true. if someone actually scooped up everything and figured out a model um, and there, I mean, and you can figure out a model where it's just every, everything's if everything, if Amazon was able to get a licensing deal for everything everywhere, there would be no more prime except for the original content. And it would basically just be five bucks a movie on everything yeah. forever 
and now you're talking about kind of the worst of all worlds where you can watch Amazon original content for free, but to literally watch anything else, two bucks an episode, five bucks a feature, take it or leave it. You've got nowhere else to yeah. go. Um, and I know people will always think that that's the moment where torrenting, torrenting, it's a weird sentence, where the, the torrenters step in and create a digital backstop for all this stuff. It's never going to be pervasive enough yeah. and it's never going to be platformed in a kind of way that makes makes for uh, a low point of entry consumer experience or makes for um, a a legitimate platform to disseminate this stuff in a way that gets around the the big companies yes yeah. and it's not, I've, I've just never really i've never it's thought not that. accessible enough for people either it gets too confusing for a lot of people and even how to do it and yes. how to do it say like unless they make it safer to do and more accessible right but at that point right if they're doing that then somebody's running it as a business anyway at that point so then it's yeah then it's a moot point it's or or, or using your com- or using your computer to mine bitcoin or doing i mean yeah. it, 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 it affords a lot of really unpleasant right. opportunities when you're when you're talking about you know kind of great great gray zone legality yeah. um and and unfamiliar i mean people i think if that happened and people and people would just kind of suck it up and just watch just know that every time they want to watch a movie with their friends it's going to be five bucks yes yeah. or and i think amazon could maybe put that together if they ate netflix and maybe but, yeah. one or two other things they could put enough of a lean on uh, or maybe Amazon has everything but Disney, and then you have two, and then Disney has their thing, and Amazon has their thing. But Amazon's got all the Universal, all the Warner Brothers, all the whatever, and then you've got the duopoly that this often, you know, du- duopolies are very, very common. Uh, and I wouldn't be shocked if we all this balkanization ended up in a duopoly that looks very much like that with Disney kind of free rolling all their original IP on a format and some other company, uh, you know, kind of taking a, an a la carte chunk. Yeah, it will. I, I mean, Dis- but, it, but no matter what it's Disney is, is Apple. Amazon is Android. Disney is Apple. Amazon <laughs> is Microsoft. Like you're going, Amazon would have everything and would have more and would be like more open. Yep. Disney's going to be kind of closed door. We have our technology. Like, yeah, it is. It's going to happen, Mm -hmm. whether it's Amazon or somebody else. But Amazon seems like the natural person to step up to the Disney giant, which already is sucking things in. So, yeah, yeah, that's probably where we're headed. And you just, I don't know. Who knows what this thing's going to look like? It's a very interesting industry because it's one of the last where like there is so much fragmentation still and they're ha- they're just now starting mm-hmm. to cons- they've always consolidated but like look at everything look at food it's like ne- Nestle literally owns everything and you just don't even know it and like everything you buy <laughs> and now there's going to be like two 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 grocery store companies yeah, I mean the, if the, if the yeah. they've already started merging yeah. everything is merging down to literally it's going to be well, it's it's the United States. It's red and blue. It's it's black and white. It's like <laughs> I don't know what it is about us. You can only give us two choices, and you have to simplify it. I guess, yeah. and that's gets really complicated after I, two. I guess so because that's the way the whole country's set up. Is like you have two choices, so choose one, and there is no gray area. Choose Apple, Microsoft, Democrat, Republican, whatever it is. You get two, and that's the way we're probably headed. Um, but we'll see. It'll be interesting. But yeah, but if someone steps in, I still, but I still think it's possible for to for physical media to survive under very specific circumstances. Yeah. I think it's possible for video stores to survive as long as they're they know what they're they have a they have a, a goal in addition to a business. They have a mission in addition yeah, to, build to community. Uh, yeah. Right, it's, absolutely. Yeah, and that's the difference, and that's why. You know, you got and hey, if Amazon takes everything up and is like, we're charging five bucks a movie. Well, your your twenty dollars a month just sounds a whole lot better for unlimited access to yeah. fifteen thousand. So there right. is a spot yeah, I, for that, even in a world that gets crazy, which is nice. Right, and the, and you know, unless, I mean, unless like fair use doctrine, unless that changes or something like that, which seems really really hard to believe. To uh, 
yeah. right. <laughs> be tough to do. Uh, you know, second sale, all that stuff. I, I think. I think uh, we still have we still have titles that ran out regularly that have been the catalog that have been the catalog for over over a decade. Yeah. Um, you know, this in terms of the durability of the format, I don't worry about that that much. Uh, it's mostly someone's willing ability to play it and for us to be able to provide them with things right. on the format we traffic in because it actually exists. Yeah. I think that's way more the hang up. But we, you know, we leverage the streaming age ourselves in this in the in the screening room yeah. all the time. I mean, that there's there's no doubt that this is not going away or it's going to fade out or lose or something like that. But the, you know, we, we show movies all the time and rent out things all the time. I mean, people have rented out the, the screening room to watch the finale of one of like the Disney Marvel shows, that kind of thing. I mean, there's still, people still want to congregate. They still want to watch things. They, how they consume their media, I think means a lot less to them than being able to want than being able to watch the stuff they want to watch yep. um, and participate in the the zeitgeists, whether it was you know whether it's the new Game of Thrones thing or the new Lord of the Rings thing or whatever new show is out or whatever new movie people are talking about, they want to be able to consume these things. Streaming is just easier, more convenient, and more cost effective, yep. but it also is perfectly conceived for everything to be disposable. Um, That's, and that's not, that's, I think great. If you're a profitable content creator, or if you can borrow billions of dollars to crank out hundreds of hours of, of, uh, of new content every month. Um, But for movie people and for, uh, Film buffs, insert your term of choice here, cinephiles. The what physical media provides, I think, is not going to be uh, addressed by streaming services or by or by uh, uh, broadband companies. Yeah. Uh, as, as when and eventually, those things are probably going to be one thing also. Um, and I think physical media will always backstop your, your quest to see everything by a director to dive in further into a, a film movement or, uh, a, a time and place in movie history. I think that's, that's where this stuff matters in a, in a cultural way, even if it doesn't matter in a, kind of fashionable way or in a uh, fleeting kind of way, I guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say that no one's going to be watching Game of Thrones five years from now. I don't think anyone's going to be watching Game of Thrones five years from now. I don't. Uh, I often tell you, well, no, I mean, it's never going to go away. I'm like, I don't, like, when was the last time? I remember when Orange is the New Black was like the biggest thing ever. Yeah. No one watches these shows it anymore. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to be on to the next thing. It won't, it won't but go away. If the media is there. Culturally, but right. You're not, right. I, I've watched every episode of Game of Thrones. <laughs> I, I'm not picking on Game of Thrones no, no, either. No, I'm just saying, like, these big zeitgeist, yeah, big cultural. I couldn't see myself going back and doing that again anytime soon unless i had a reason like i have a one-year-old son so like if he's if right. he's 16 and is like i've heard this game of thrones like this is what i would do with like the sopranos or something i'd be like i didn't watch that because i was too right. young now i'll watch it like i'll watch it again with him but i'm i'm right. not gonna sit there and watch it over and over again you're right well and, and we, we used to get t we used to keep up with tv a lot more um as the the, the store did I don't see the point anymore because yeah. people don't return to these things. Right. I mean, our our one one Blu-ray copy of Videodrome will check out more times in a year mm-hmm. than we will get even requests for for uh, for certain shows or seasons or anything like that. And most of the time, when people do come in looking for shows, it's something that's like like Danish. Or it's something that we can't provide yeah. them anyway. And the lag time between uh, the show's airing, uh, especially for like Netflix stuff that just gets batch dropped. I mean, 
uh, it could be a year and a half later. You could have already marched through two new series by that point and not really yeah. give a crap well, about the thing It's anymore. all disposable again. That's what it is. All that yeah. content's disposable. But, and it's supposed to be. Yeah. That's by, you know, it's by, it's by yeah, design. It's all disposable, but yeah, a movie like Videodrome, you know, you, you could watch that several times. I mean, I there are movies I've watched. I will watch Game of Thrones once. There are movies that I don't even <laughs> maybe like as much as I like Game of Thrones that I will watch two, three, four, five, six times because there's also right. time commitment too. It's like, okay, in two hours I can get the whole story or in 80 hours I can get the whole story. And it's like, but the eight, but the 80 hours in the whole story when it, it's, when it's, you know, out, when it's all a buff, yeah. when it's a buffet and not, and not a restaurant yeah. that there's, there's some real appeal to Absolutely. that. And it feels like value for money when, when the, when the season drops and you know that your next like, you know, seven to 10 TV nights right. are booked because you're going to get through this thing. And, you know, there's, there's, I think there's some comfort to that. And there's definitely a, that, that is, that is kind of the social component to, uh, to streaming, I yeah. think, especially with series is that, you know, you, you can, you and your friends can make sure you don't spoiler alert each other and talk about, you know, the thing and kind of watch it in sequence or kind of take turns going over to each other's houses on Friday nights to watch the latest episode of whatever. Um, and there is a social component to streaming in that regard. I'm not saying that there's streaming is just a solitary mm -hmm. activity because it's not. Yeah. I think the pandemic was very instructive about how things like watching parties yeah. uh, and how the streaming services figured out a way to make the group watch thing possible and kind of, and, and palatable to more people. But the, uh, but the reality is that these things are, are, are going to come and go. Whereas films that have a certain commercial appeal, critical appeal, social appeal, uh, are, are going to be around much longer than, uh, a, a TV show that's, you know, trending for three weeks and then no one ever kind of talks about it yeah. again. No, I, I, you're, you're spot on. And I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought even about it in that way, but you're right. I mean, there is something about something about the movie versus the TV show, even in just the way that that's consumed and why, why yeah. you saw TV shows disappear from physical media first, I think for, for good reason, yep. they were more disposable. Yes. Um, yeah, this, this was, this was a good conversation. This is, I didn't know where this was going to head and we're here, <laughs> but this was, this was good. I really enjoyed this. So, um, hopefully you guys listening, got something out of this. Cause I think we dove into a lot of stuff and covered some interesting territory that I haven't talked about previously, um, on the podcast, surprisingly enough. So I, uh, I appreciate you coming on for sure. This was good. I'll Absolutely. definitely have to stop by where can, uh, get your plug in here before we go where can people find you online where can they find you in person you can find us in person at uh 3203 washington street in jamaica plain that's a neighborhood in boston right on the corner of washington and montebello there is street parking it's occasionally limited and watch out on mondays for street sweeping we're not open and you will get towed <laughs> uh the website is the vu in jp.com uh all the social links are on there we have uh we had one TikTok go viral and then we kind of stopped paying attention. You kind of freaked us <laughs> out, but uh, we do regular posts on Instagram, uh, not as much on Twitter because uh, it's gross. Um, and we got a Facebook page, but the website's got the parameters for signing up for a media subscription, running out the screening room. Our inventory is listed on there; it's updated every day. Uh, keyword title search, uh, but yeah, we uh we have fifteen thousand feature films. Uh, plus growing every week, every decade, every genre, every language, uh, all subscription model. But we do pre-order things for people. If you're a collector, hit us up. We can let uh, let you know what we can do for you on that sure. front. Uh, we're also a full-service coffee bar. Uh, we roast all of our own beans, full espresso menu, a whole bunch of movie-titled, themed, uh, goofy drinks uh, that we just make up. Right. Uh, we're open 8 to 6, Tuesday through Saturday, 8 to 3 on Sunday, closed on Monday, but yeah, if you need a cup of coffee, if you need uh, need a little snack or a treat or some popcorn or a uh, 
you know, a, a, an, a Laura Palmer, which is what we call an Arnold Palmer. <laughs> it's stuff like that. Yeah. It's a lot of really, it's a lot of really, a lot of really hammy references, but you can get a bag of beans. You can uh, look, check out the racks, see what you think. Look at our director wall. Uh, let us know what you think of our ridiculous little uh, sections. We're doing a big reorg right now. So everything is kind of a mess, but you'll, it'll be very obvious uh, what the, the vibe of the place is by, by the, uh, the, the menu and the, uh, and the uh, the and the uh, section uh, section headings um, and yeah we rent out the screening room it's eighteen theater chairs that kind of stadium up I uh, can't see real well um, but it's twelve foot screen seven hundred seven hundred watt receiver we've got different optical drives we've got you can bring in a game console but we play uh, off region media we've got a we've got a VCR hooked up to it it looks not awesome but it does exist. Um, but there's not really much we can't put up on the screen that you can't watch at home. Uh, you can log into your streaming services. We make some of the basic stuff available. Obviously, obviously our media catalog is available, but you can rent out the room for a group of your friends. We've done everything from like book signings to birthday parties, uh, everything in between, everything in between. Cool. You can watch fun stuff. You can watch serious stuff, different formats, languages it's all it's all available you can awesome. pretty much make a make a day of it make an afternoon of it cool it's a good yeah. time no it sounds like a really good time so yeah i'll put uh i'll put all the links down in the uh the video description too and in the in the spotify apple podcast links whether you're listening or watching whatever you're doing i'll put all those links down there so you guys can check it out but boston's uh boston's last video store right so Go, go yes, support. very much go so. Support. Go but there is there there is there is one in there is one in Maynard though. Yeah. There is there are, I, I I'm always kind of keeping tabs on the ones that are still kind of like in New England. And I yep. know that there's I know there's one left in Maynard. I always try to like let people know that we're not the and I only mention that because people are like so you're the last one like in America. No, like, no we're not the last one in America. <laughs> but but you know I mean if you don't you don't leave Boston much and you're not. Yeah hip to physical media or not really much of a movie person. There are lots of other video stores all over the country, even Massachusetts up and down the East coast, uh, around, uh, globally, they still exist. Oh, yeah. They're still, they're still hanging out. So just, just so people know that we're not literally the only ones still doing this. Uh, but yeah, that's, I always, I always want to make sure people know that this is not, we're not, we're not the Alamo. We're just, Part of a chain of Alamos right. that uh, that still exist uh, worldwide. Yeah, no, they're out there. We've talked to a couple others in the podcast too. There's one down in Baltimore. Um, there's one in Beyond. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. we talked yep. to them. Yeah, they're out there. So whether you're in Boston or not, you know, go go looking around, support these places. Um, but definitely, if you're in the Boston area or anywhere really in New England, I think it's probably worth a drive. So go check them out. All the links are in the description and. Uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on. This was a this is a good. Episode. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate this. This is this is a this is a lot of fun. I don't I get to talk movies with a lot of people every day, but I do not get to talk media that much. And uh, so yeah, so this is this is the part of this is kind of the the flip side of the. You didn't ask me what my favorite movie is. You didn't ask me what I thought of this that or the other thing, which is great because I get those questions sure. all the yep. time. Right? No, no. I was I, no. I'm saying I was glad. I'm glad. I'm glad to be able to talk yeah. kind of like media and kind of the the business of this as opposed to what I thought of this, that, or the other sure. thing. That's what we do. That's how I, that's <laughs> yes. how I tried to stay it's an important it's from an imp- thousands of other movie YouTube channels is we're going to cover a very specific have, portion of the industry. Right. So. Well, and a part that I think really, and I think a part that I think really matters yeah. in a way that kind of maybe gets lost in the, lost in the, lost in the shuffle sometimes. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate it. And we'll, uh, we'll definitely talk again soon. All right, guys, so that is it for the episode with Kevin. I know a long one, and we kind of went all over the place, but it was a really fun conversation. I had a really good time talking to him. I think he's super smart, especially when it comes to where physical media is headed. He's got a good business head on his shoulders, too. Obviously, still running this business in 2022. Not an easy thing. They survived COVID. They're still going. And so, you know, definitely if you're in the Boston area, Jamaica Plain is not far away. You can get there easily by train. You could even walk depending on which area you're staying in. But it is 
totally worth checking out with their huge library of movies. And it's just a really cool spot to go grab a coffee, talk to other people who love movies like you and, you know, hang out and just have a good time. I'm sure that they always have something playing on the screens. They always have a bunch of new titles, even if you just want to browse the collection, maybe get an idea of what you want to grab. Super cool that we still have these places in 2022. And that's why I do want to keep highlighting them and talking to their owners, because I think they have some of the most unique perspectives in the world when it comes to physical media and how important it is even in you know the streaming digital age so thanks kevin for the time thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule i know it's crazy running a business like that so much much appreciated and you know i'll leave all the links to the view and jp if you guys want to check it out like kevin said you know you can even rent out their little screening room which could be a lot of fun if you want to watch you know the latest movie they've got all the equipment so super cool place to hang out i'll link all their social media and their website in the description and as always, make sure you're subscribed on YouTube if you're watching and you're following along on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode. Next week, I'm determining which episode to put out, so stay tuned. But episode three, it'll be a pretty good one. We're going to have a nice guest on. We're going to talk physical media and we're going to talk collecting. We're going to talk the world of movies. We're just going to, you know, chat. This is what we do on this podcast. Talk to other collectors and movie lovers, and I really enjoy doing it. So thank you for listening and or watching. Thank you to our sponsor, Established Titles, who helped make this podcast episode happen. I appreciate their support, and make sure you check them out. Links are in the description there as well. And that's about it. So have a great rest of your day. Stay safe, stay healthy out there, and I'll talk to you all. Coming soon. Be sure to subscribe to the Films at Home podcast using your favorite app so you don't miss another episode. And while you're there, don't forget to rate and review this podcast, which helps us out tremendously. You can also help support us by watching our short form content over on YouTube and TikTok by searching Films at Home. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at films underscore at underscore home. The intro and outro were created by Elon Osborne. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.